Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text this morning for our consideration from Luke's Gospel. We read from the 27th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty silver coins to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied, that's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left, and he went out and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the coin and said, it's against the law to put this into the treasury, since it's blood money. So he decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That's why it's been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was written by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 silver coins of Christ set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord had commanded me. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, this past week my wife and I were watching something that we had recorded from the History Channel series that came out back in 2013 titled The Bible. And the episode that we were watching, I think it was the first episode that we were watching, had the event of Abraham being asked to take his son Isaac and use and make him a sacrifice for God. And it was an emotional scene. Abraham takes his son, they're carrying the wood up to be used for the fire for the sacrifice. And then Abraham begins to bind Isaac's hands. And the son looks up at his father and says, Father. And then the scene goes on. As I read the words of the text this morning, that thought popped into my mind, and they bound Jesus. Why? What possible reason could there have been to bound, bind Jesus? He was preaching a message of forgiveness and repentance for the forgiveness of sins. He was healing. He was performing miracles. He had empathy and compassion for the people. But yet here, this innocent man has his hands bound tightly and he's being led away. I thought that was the same thing with, with Isaac, wasn't it? But then there was the picture of the lamb that was caught in the thicket. And that was then used as a sacrifice. Isaac was spared and the lamb was used as a sacrifice to God. You and I have been spared. Christ was bound, brought before a sham court and trial, sentenced to be death, to, to be put to death, executed, all for you and I, and for the sins of the world. And he willingly went that way for us. Today we see our Lord standing before Pilate, standing before this court prior to that, that says they were looking for a way to kill him. The sentence was already there. Now it was just a justification for them doing it or any kind of evidence that they could be brought, that they could bring forward to, to have them do what they wanted to do, to do away with him. Judas had devised a scheme that he was going to make a little money off of this, and he plotted to have Jesus turned over to them so that they could arrest him. And it worked. They gave him 30 silver coins, he took them to the Garden of Gethsemane, he kisses Jesus on the cheek, and they arrest Jesus. And so Judas' mission accomplished. Then they he saw what was happening to Jesus. And no longer was it a mission accomplished. Now it was something Wait a minute. I didn't expect this to happen. 
How many of us in life don't want do-overs? That was a foolish thing I did. That was dumb. That was, why did I, I wasn't thinking. Oh, to be able to have that chance over again. I wouldn't make those same mistakes. Ah, you'd make different ones. Maybe not the same one. You aren't free from not making mistakes. But now that he realized this was, this was something that was not right. And he regretted what he did. Well, what's regret? I put too much water into the coffee pot and it flowed over. Huh. I should have looked and see if there was some in there to begin with. I regret doing that. Now I have to clean up this mess. Okay, I regret doing that. We're told that Judas was filled with remorse. Remorse goes a little deeper, doesn't it? Because it involves the mind. And um, I regret doing this because it caused pain to someone else. I kind of regret saying that because now you know they're 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 angry at me and they're upset with me. Repentance. That is where I regret what I have done. I am sorry for what I have done. My mind tells me I have offended someone I have sinned against. And repentance tells me that now the will is, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. And unfortunately, that was missing with Judas, wasn't it? There was not that repentance. I've sinned. Yeah, look what I did. I caused some bad things to be happening as Jesus. I'm filled with remorse over it. So what does he do? He goes to the temple court and he takes that. Guilt is a terrible thing. Who of you, driving down the freeway, when you come over the hill and there's the state patrol seated in the medium, doesn't look right away at your speedometer? And who of you doesn't say, oh, it's going 73 in a 70 mile an hour zone and immediately... Why? Guilt. I remember one time years ago, um, the person preparing my taxes had made a, an error. And it was more than just an error. It was like about a $500 error. And I get this notification from the IRS stamped on there, urgent attention and so on. And um, yeah, the heart kind of flutters when you get something that's official for the IRS. Because you know, deep down, there's probably something that I did that wasn't right. Not meaning to do it, but guilt. Guilt. It's, it's just there. And, and you feel like, oh, they're going to come and they're going to arrest me now. Or they're gonna, what are they going to do to me? And, and so on. And so, but we all know what it is. Guilt sometimes keeps us from doing further things. Perhaps Judas didn't turn in the whole gang of disciples because he was feeling guilty over what happened to Jesus. Maybe he was going to learn a lesson from it or whatever. Guilt can have a way of stopping us from continuing on some path. Turn it around. But ultimately, guilt eats away. It destroys life. It, it tears us apart. And left undealt with just festers and grows and becomes something. You see it in Judas. He was upset. He was hurt. He was, all the emotions that he was going through of what, what he had done. And so he thinks, well, I'll just undo it. I'll take the money back and then that'll pay for it, right? Yeah, so I'll pay whatever I was owing on that tax and now everything's good. Or I'll Put my speed down to 70 and keep the cruise on there and everything will be good. You know, we always have a way of trying to fix our own problems. <coughs> you know, some of the things I just mentioned are certainly things that, that we can do things to take precautions and take steps to do. But sin, I can't fix my problems. <clears throat> sin is something that is eating away and is destroying me and, and is, is inwardly killing me, spiritually anyway, and oftentimes physically. And so Judas thought, well, I can take care of it. I'll take the money back. And, then, and it's, it is inter interesting, too. He, he takes it back to where he got it from. He goes into the temple. 
first of all, he really wasn't supposed to be in there. That was off limits to anybody but the priest, but he goes in there. And here he meets these, these individuals. You know, what's interesting about this, too, is, um, oh, how do I want to say it? These were the top of the field, so to speak, of the church. It would be like our synod president or our seminary president and faculty and our district presidents. And we go in there before them, and here they are plotting to kill Jesus. We didn't maybe fully know that at the time, so we go there wanting to get rid of this guilt. And what do the leaders of the church do? It's not our problem. Why are you bringing that to us? You go and deal with it. Live with the consequences of your actions. I don't think I'd be a pastor very long if you came to me with a problem and I would say, yeah, that's a problem. Deal with it. I got other things going on. Game's on here in 10 minutes. The place that he was going to for help offered him no help at all. Rather than going to the Lord, and rather than going in prayer, he could have gone to the Lord here and say, Lord, forgive me, I have sinned against you. But he thought he could fix it. He could like undo what he'd done. And it doesn't work that way. It only increases. And if it doesn't increase the guilt, it maybe salves over something for a short time, but then it comes back with a vengeance at some time later on. Guilt needs to be dealt with. It's dealt with on the cross. It's dealt with when we look at the cross and see that what Jesus died for. He died for me and for my sin and for my salvation. Now these leaders. Isn't it interesting? First of all, Jesus' life wasn't much to them. 30 silver coins. That's all he was worth. He wasn't even worth that. They have to give the money away. A lot of people look at Jesus that way today. He's not worth much to me. He's not worth my time on a Sunday morning. He's not worth my time during the week to pray to him. He's not worth my time to read his word and to meditate upon him. I got other things more important. The chief priest, look at that and say, well, we don't have time for you, Judas. We really don't want this money, but that betrays something. See, there was even guilt going on in these chief priests and the leaders' wives. As, as much as they hated Jesus, there was still guilt there. And people will say, oh, no, no, I, 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 don't, do, I don't do religion. You know, I don't, I don't do Christianity. I don't do Jesus. I don't do Bible and stuff like that. No, I don't do that. Uh, methinks thou dost protest too much. There's guilt going on in their lives. And it's a guilt that is standing right in front of them. The one that they are mocking and criticizing and rebelling against is the one who saves them from that. And so what do they do? They think, well, I'll do something charitable. I'll go buy a potter's field and we'll use the money to buy the potter's field for burial of strangers and things like that. Isn't that noteworthy? Won't the people say, oh, what generous people those are. They bought that field so strangers could have a, a cemetery. Oh, how wonderful they are. We don't buy God's love with charitable deeds. We don't buy his love and forgiveness with our offerings on a Sunday morning. We don't buy his love and forgiveness by doing nice things for other people. They thought they could. Actually, they were kind of convinced that they could. They're probably patting themselves on the back and saying, hey, good idea. Who came up with that one? Yeah, good idea. Someone should give you a raise. You know, you're really... Um, guilt. Guilt festers. And it just eats away. And so the irony of it all the one who was bound, standing in front of them, 
was the one who unbinds the sins of all, who unbinds the burden of conscience, who unbinds the, the heart that is so filled with apprehension and doubts and fears. <coughs> there, standing right before you, who the world bound, the one who unlooses a sin and pays for all of our sins. Judas didn't see that. The leaders didn't see that. The people when they're crying out, crucify, 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 didn't understand that. But because someone does not understand something, does not make it real. Because I choose to not believe in Jesus, does not believe that Jesus is not your Savior. Feelings betray. My sinful thoughts and <coughs> rationing and reasoning betrays. But Jesus never does. The cross ever stands before us as a reminder that someone took upon himself my guilt, my despair, my sin, and he went and paid for that to free me, to unburden the guilt. Still had to pay the fine with the IRS. Still we're going to confess it's a sin, but yet we know with God there is forgiveness. And we say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the Lord forgives. And he removes that burden of guilt. And he takes away that heavy burden that I carry all the time. And he gives me peace. Life situations may not change. But God has changed me. He has changed me from the inside out. And now I see things differently. And now my actions say that what I do... I don't do so that you will pardon me. I do because you have pardoned me. And now I want my life to be a reflection of the love I have for you and for all you've done for me. Yeah, guilt is a terrible thing. Jesus knew that too. And so that's why he did something for us. And that's why the cross is always that reminder. It is the power of God in salvation that frees us from the punishment and the burden of sin and the burden of a guilty conscience by setting me free, free in Christ, free indeed. Amen.